This conference will now be recorded. Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Risa Shimoda with the River Management Society. Thanks for joining us for one of our River Management Roundtables. We'll go into um, talking about what the roundtables are at the end. But this one is titled, What Does ADA for River Access Really Mean? And we have a couple of awesome presenters to share with uh, you what, what that is. Um, so here we go. Twice monthly, we do River Management Roundtables. The first, the second Tuesday of each month, like today, we do on the river sessions that are more operational oriented, operationally oriented. And then on the fourth Tuesday of the month, we do workplace culture it, um, sessions that are more either soft skills or talking about things that are not so much dealing with the, um, the hardware on the river itself. And all the types of folks that you see in the list are those that we welcome. And the, the tie that binds is that everyone works on rivers, regardless of if you work for an agency, public, private, or individual consultant, um, or, or a scientist, any kind of professional. You're always welcome, and these are always free. So hi, everyone. I'm Angie Furman. I'm the River Training Center Coordinator for River Management Society. And Risa and I are excited to have Duncan Hay and John Anderson joining us. Duncan Hay is with the Park Service, and John Anderson is an architect and whitewater course designer. Um, and just before we get started here in a minute, um, we'll have Duncan and John go and they can introduce themselves as they start, but I just want to remind us all just a couple group norms and agreements of respecting one another and trying to stay on topic, but staying engaged and asking questions. You'll see we have the chat box. Would love to know who's joining us. So um, if you haven't already, feel free to put where you're joining us from or your organization in the chat there. And then during today's presentation, uh, we're going to have some time where they're sharing with us, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. All right, so I think we're going to go ahead and start with John. John, if you want to introduce yourself and then um, go ahead. Sure. Um, I am, my background is uh, whitewater slalom uh, from way back in the 80s and 70s. Um, um, I'm also an architect, I'm, so I'm used to vertical construction and ADA access as it relates to buildings, well versed in that. Um, um, what we've found, um, of course, is that uh, the ADA really doesn't apply to uh, river access or uh, trailer boat access. And in terms of um, uh, in terms of accessibility, we're dealing with a population who is um, probably not a, not a candidate for a nursing home. Uh, these are outdoor adventure people. Um, uh, uh, the individual you see here is a um, is a uh, um, an Iraq uh, or Afghanistan war veteran. Um, it's actually um, uh, adaptive paddling and uh, is is very popular with um, uh, with amputees from um, from both wars. Uh, so um, uh, these people are in the prime of life. They're fit and they are ready to go. We just don't want to get in their way. So. The next slide, uh, this is a little bit of background on the ADA. Um, where an, an ADA accessible route is required wherever you have um, a facility or an activity or a building or something at the end of the line um, that, you're, that, ha that is required by law to be accessible. These typically are buildings, uh, mostly restrooms. In a park, you would see restrooms, food services, vis visitor centers amphitheaters or any places of, of assembly that's outside. That also applies to uh, playgrounds and play equipment. Uh, our, our local county here in Montgomery County, Maryland has, has been sued um, numerous times for compliance uh, with their playgrounds and they've uh, spent a lot of time and money adapting and making sure that all their kitty playgrounds are, are accessible. Um, um, docks and piers, water taxis, fishing piers, any, any item like that, I think it's also covered by ADA. Um, it does not apply, uh, obviously, to hand-carried launches. I, I don't think anybody really contemplated that when they're writing it. 
and trailer uh, trailer boat launches are quite impractical because uh, some of the slopes are so shallow that your truck would be uh, a quarter of a mile out in the river or lake before the water was deep enough to actually launch your boat. So, uh, next slide. Apologize for the noise. I hope it wasn't on this end. Um, the components um, to get you from your car to your accessible space um, typically is a, um, um, you know, since we are a car, a car dependent in, in a country, parking space, the parking lot pavement, um, the uh, curb cut from the parking lot to the sidewalk, and the sidewalk that leads you up to the point where you engage with a building. Um, is um, uh, so um, in this case, this is a, a one of our favorite canoe liveries in Michigan uh, with a, a snack bar. Uh, you buy your ticket there, uh, and then you proceed to your rafting adventure. Um, uh, go ahead to the next one. Uh, our um, our uh, business is primarily with. Um, with river access. We have Duncan is primarily his experiences with the Erie Canal. And you'll see some very different examples here. This is an example where we voluntarily provided uh, as close as possible to universal access to the river. This is a high volume um, raft launch on the Chattahoochee River in Tennessee. Um, we used a uh, next slide. Um, it is a commercial launch, as you can see. Uh, we used a 5% grade. Uh, down to the river from from the parking lot. The, um, what this five percent grade does, it gets it means you don't have to have handrails or landings or any other vertical uh, construction that could that get you know um, get damaged by uh, by floods. Um, this is a, obviously a, a heavy broom finish concrete surface at that five percent grade. Um, it, it meets ADA in terms of slope and cross slope. Um, the side, the side of, the, uh, of the path is um, um, lined with boulders that rise above the level of the path. We like these for transferring. This um, there's six or seven feet of, grit of, uh, of water surface elevation difference, according to how much power, how much power we're generating at the power plant here. Um, at the end of this ramp, and the various points along the ramp. Um, is essentially a, um, a seal launch or a beach launch for a kayak. You transfer from your chair uh, into your into your boat at the edge of the water, and then seal launch. There are also step off launches, and we'll cover those in a little bit. But the step off launch is is preferred by um, open boaters like myself, um, where you actually have some deep water and a fairly high step where you can actually brace your um, brace your paddle against the walls of your canoe step into your canoe while the while the boat is held steady by the paddle impinging on the step and the next slide um this is um this is an example well that's an, the previous example was where we did we, we did everything we could um here we have a situation in north carolina on the nanahala river where they just simply did the best they could with the limited space they have. And I think they did, you know, obviously the ramp here is not an ADA ramp. Um, there are handrails. Um, they provided a textured uh, surface for, uh, for traction. At the bottom of the ramp, they have a beach launch and they also have a step off uh, launch. Uh, the step off is that is that line just below the water surface where um, you can, where you have enough depth to uh, launch your canoe without, um, without dragging um, without uh, basically launching off the beach. The next image is kind of a close-up of that beach. It shows a couple of guys here. They're actually getting out. Um, some transfer boulders would be nice here to get out of your get out of your boat, but that step off there is a way of getting enough deep water so that rafts or canoes uh, can launch easily. Um, the next image is um, uh, one that I think bears some, some um, some discussion of, of handrails and guardrails. There are certain, wherever you have handrails and guardrails related to stairs and retaining walls, um, you they, they have to conform to code. These apparently don't, they're, they're probably grandfathered in, but the height, of, the height, the spacing of the members, the height of the railing above the steps, that is all regulated by building codes um, and, and is prescribed. Um, 
We generally try to avoid them just flooding. Uh, the next image shows flooding uh, and what can happen. And as river people, you you know this, you've seen this movie. Um, you can um, imagine what um, uh, a delicate dock or um, handrail system could, could be subjected to in a, in, a, in a riverine environment. And of course, that's entirely site dependent. Uh, the next image um, go ahead. Um, this image shows, um, sorry for the print, uh, we've had trouble with formatting here, but this is an example where they didn't even try uh, to conform to ADA or anything like it. Uh, these are steps. Um, uh, without being critical, this is a Virginia Department of Game and the Fisheries project. Um, this, you know, there, uh, there could be budgetary constraints, which, um, or mo most likely, uh, this, the grade differential is too high. Um, and there are, um, when you begin to wind down a, a tall slope, there are, um, there are issues with uh, shoreline impacts where you could be zigzagging back and forth uh, and disturb 100 yards of shoreline. Uh, there could be some other site constraints, um, uh, like, um, um, cultural resources, historic resources, wetlands, endangered species. There all, could be all kinds of things that would prevent you from having a large site impact that would, require, that, that would be needed in order to provide um, um, an ADA grade or even anything like it um, down, down the tall slope. Um, the next image, looks like we're going backwards here. Let's see if we Um, this, I think, is an example. This is a high volume um, put in at the, at the, at the Nantahala Outdoor Center, or actually the Nantahala River in North Carolina, uh, where we have, um, this, is, this is probably 300,000 plus uh, river users per year, very high volume. Um, they have a, um, um, I think, a very attractive put in here. Um, it actually is just a put in. No one takes out here because this is the beginning of the trip where the water appears. Um, Next image uh, shows a quite a little bit of different view uh, from that. Take note of that um, that retaining wall there on the right, because uh, I, I think that's that you don't see it in this picture. But the edge of the grass is a retaining wall where you can transfer into your boat and do a seal launch in case in the case of a, um, a kayak. Or there's a very comfortable uh, grade difference between the the concrete walkway and the water surface. Uh, where you can trans, where you can um, uh, get into your canoe while bracing against the gunnels and paddle and shore um, for stability. And um, note also too, the water is fairly is deep enough so that when you you don't pit on when you uh, seal launch. So and there's calm water. So there's a lot to like about this, and it works. It's worked for decades, uh, probably half a century or more since the 70s. Uh, this is uh, the next one is a, is just another image. Of the um, of the takeout where the where they've uh, they have such high volume they've segregated the commercial raft tra traffic and they actually direct raft traffic to certain certain landing zones. This is it's almost like an airport. They have so many so many boats. Um, this is that low water um, commercial raft takeout. This is um, um, on the right on river right and river left is the um, private boaters beach. Um, um, I think it's worth noting too that the um, you know if you're in a wheelchair or have a disability you know the commercial uh, outfit uh, basically you're in their charge your your basic your experience is dictated by them and they're responsible for accommodating their needs um, and the the, the, the planner is uh, simply we're going to try to do the best we can in terms of accommodating a reasonable access uh, to the river so and I think that's all I have. I see. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to mute here. So if that's over to me, uh, I'm going to try this a different way and try by sharing screens. Uh, can you guys see stuff? Because I can't at this point. <laughs> can I get a nod? Okay. It's yeah. One of the you, just need to go up to, you just need to go up to your first slide. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so the first slide, uh, I've got some definitions. When, when we talk about ADA, 
that tends to be kind of a, we, we tend to lump a whole lot of things together. Um, actually, before there was the ADA, there was the Architectural Barriers Act, which applied to uh, federal facilities and federally funded facilities. Then we got the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, which you have to remember is a civil right, piece of civil rights legislation that prohibits discrimination. Um, and ADA, the difference between that and our ABA was that it extended and applied to state, municipal, and commercial uh, facilities of public accommodation. So in other words, restaurants, theaters, um, marinas, you name it, it's, it's had an, uh, an effect on, on the architecture that we live with. Um, there were guidelines published in the 90s. Those were codified into standards in 2010. And the distinction is that the guidelines were just that, guidelines. The, uh, the standards have the force of regulation. Um, and they are both written by and, and uh, interpreted by and assisted by the U.S. Access Board. Uh, and there'll be links to all of these uh, later in the, in the show. Um, so John talked about grade change. Um, anything that is has a, a running change in grade of greater than 1 in 20 is classified as a ramp. Um, the maximum you can go to for wheelchair access under ADA is, is 1 in 12 which for those of us who work in feet and inches makes things really easy. Basically, if you want a foot and a half or 30 inches of grade change, you've got to have a 30 foot long ramp. The other thing to bear in mind, and this is often overlooked, is that, you know, picture yourself cranking up a 30 foot ramp at a, at a uh, uh, 8.3% incline, you get tired. So every 30 feet, you've got to have a level resting uh, spot. Um, and that as I say, is often overlooked in site designs, but it's it's an important uh, element for uh, for users. Um, you can have the re the resting spot can be a switchback, uh, and we often see this in riverbank uh, situations where you know you can't run a straight line down the diagonal of the riverbank. The challenge is much of the ADA standard was written with the idea of a single user in a wheelchair. Now. Picture this trying to negotiate a boat around that corner where you've got a wheelchair and, you know, even a 10 foot, 10, six uh, pack canoe uh, is going to have a hard time making that corner, let alone, you know, a, a 16 or 18 foot tandem boat. So um, oftentimes the, you know, again, the ADA standards are a minimum. Uh, you need to think in terms of river access of, well, that's the minimum for an individual in a wheelchair. What's the minimum for those of us who are who are trying to get boats to and from the, uh, the water? Um, and John mentioned handrails. Uh, handrails are required, um, but they also pose a real problem in rivers because they are debris traps and they get wrecked. And, you know, we see lots of them that get pretzeled at the end of the season. Um, so uh, he showed some that were attached to a wall that's a little bit better defended, um, but it is uh, an issue. The other thing to bear in mind is that ADA um, is a federal standard or a national standard. Many states have adopted it into and expanded upon it in their building codes. So, for example, minimum width uh, at a federal level is 36 inches. If you're working in California, it's 48. And in some cases, in some states, it's 60. So you need to, in looking at all this stuff, you need to look at both um, the ADA requirements and, uh, and what applies in the building codes uh, where you work. Section 10 of the ADA standards focuses on recreational facilities. And 1003 looks at recreate, specifically at recreational boating facilities. Um, and you know, while the folks at USA Access will say, well, this applies for everything from a canoe and a kayak to a, uh, to a cabin cruiser, the fact of the matter is that most of the 1003 uh, standards focus on, on big marinas, uh, not the kind of stuff that we're dealing with in river access. And I, I, we've often found ourselves looking at this going, uh, how does this apply to, uh, to the places where we work? Um, what's specifically not addressed, and they will tell you, is what they call transfer methods. Uh, whether it's a roller dock or a transfer platform or any of those things that get people from the dock into their boat, there is no ADA standard for that. Um, and so when you have a vendor who's coming to you to say, I'm going to sell you an ADA boat launch, 
um, they're trying to sell you something that simply doesn't exist because uh, there are no standards. So it was fa faced with that, that a couple of years ago, we started saying, well, how would we apply ADA standards and best practices um, to the waterway where we work, the, the New York State Canal System? First, a little bit about the canal system, because it's a little different than the waterways that John was talking about, where he was uh, emphasizing whitewater boating. This is flat water boating. Uh, Erie Canal runs from the head of tidal navigation on the Hudson to Lake Erie, um, conveniently above Niagara Falls. Um, it's been in continuous operation since 1825, so we're coming up on our, our uh, 200th birthday. Um, Many people have sort of this image of the canal as, as a, a romantic, bucolic sort of thing where, where canal boats were told by mules walking along the, uh, the towpath. Um, it's still a working waterway today. Uh, commercial tonnage dropped way off uh, after the St. Lawrence Seaway opened in 1959, but there is still commercial traffic, principally stuff that's simply too large to move by road or rail. Uh, like these huge stainless steel tanks that are on their way to the Genesee Brewery in, uh, in Rochester. But since the 60s, the shift has really been to recreational boating. Um, the uh, canal system is part of the America's Great Loop, which at any given year, they claim there's about 3,000 boats that are making the loop uh, uh, throughout Eastern North America. Um, it is the system, which is actually made up of four branches. Most people know about the Erie Canal. Now, let's see if my pointer works. Uh, Erie Canal goes from the head of the tide at uh, just north of Albany to uh, Lake Erie at Buffalo. So it's about 350 miles. There's also the Champlain Canal, which runs uh, north from Waterford to the southern end of Lake Champlain. And from there, you can go north to the Richelieu River and on to the St. Lawrence. There's also the Oswego that goes, drops rather rapidly from the Erie Canal down to Lake Ontario and the Cayuga Seneca, which connects uh, the two largest finger lakes to the rest of the system and by extension to the rest of the world. Um, the system has always been owned and operated by New York State. Uh, it, it's managed by a public benefit corporation called the New York State Canal Corporation. Erie Canal Way National Heritage Corridor was established in 2000 um, and it's basically one municipality, one or town or city on either side of the water on the four operating branches of the canal system. People have been paddling on the canal since the 19th century. Um, that's nothing new, even though it was even more a commercial waterway then than it is, than it is now. But we've seen a real uptick um, in recent years of uh, people getting out end-to-end -end paddlers, uh, people coming out for big events. You know, you can get over 300 boats uh, in, in, in a lock at a single time. Wow. Um, uh, and, but I'd say probably the majority are close to home users who may uh, launch at one place, take out at the same place later in the day, or who um, uh, go down maybe through a couple of locks and, and take out down below. To help those folks out, uh, three years ago, Erie Canalway came out with the first edition of its guidebook. Uh, we're now, the second edition is now at the printer. Um, so there'll, there'll be a, a revised one that's available. I see Mona Karen is on the, uh, on the call. Mona is manager of, of the, uh, the water trail effort for Erie Canalway. So if you want your own copy of the guidebook, contact Mona. Um, there's also an online map uh, which has a lot of uh, features. If you click on the icon for launch sites, on the little paddler icon, you get uh, the locations of each launch site. And if you click on each of those, uh, you get a more detailed address, usually a photograph and a description of what the facilities are. And in terms of ADA access or access for people with, with different abilities, this is really important. And I'll come back to that in a little while. The launches run the range from very, very basic, you know, just a gravel slope uh, with a parking area adjacent to fairly elaborate. Uh, this one was just opened this summer in, uh, in Brockport and it's fully accessible. And nearby there are restrooms and showers. And of course the village uh, has, has um, uh, all sorts of facilities nearby. Um, 
we didn't do this in a vacuum. Uh, a lot of people have come up with some very good documents. Uh, Prepare to Launch, which was a joint RMS NPS project a few years ago. The River Access Guide. There's a good one from Iowa. There's a great one from uh, San Francisco Bay Water Trail. And they all kind of touch on the same point. There are certain characteristics that are good for any launch. Firm surface, gentle slopes, uh, docks and other fixtures close to the water line, enough water to float the boat, uh, a, 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 a space to get organized to get the boat off the car and, and, and organized to go on the water. Those are common to any decent launch. But on the canal system, we have a few challenges. Um, like the walls are pretty tall. Um, and uh, it's sometimes difficult to get your boat from the wall into the water. Uh, there's a couple of different characteristics. You know, the canal is not one uniform waterway. Um, in the western part of the state and a couple of places in, in the middle and the east are land cut sections. And these are what you traditionally might think of as, as a canal. It's an artificial channel with a towpath on one side, now a bike path, um, and uh, steep riprap banks of uh, loose channel. And it kind of winds through the countryside. Those riprap banks can uh, pose their own challenges getting in and out. They're pretty loose um, and, uh, and can be a, a, a problem. When you get to the villages, uh, in order to allow barges to, uh, to dock when this was a thriving commercial waterway, you've got vertical walls, uh, always on one side, often on both sides of the channel through the middle of, of, of the village. And yet this is the place where people want to get out and explore uh, and take advantage uh, when, they're, when they're paddlers. Whether they're, they're power boaters or paddlers, people want to get out in the center of town, and it's not always easy to do. The land cut sections are drained in the wintertime. Uh, this uh, reduces ice damage and, and makes maintenance a little easier, but it can play hob with uh, floating docks and, uh, and other uh, paddler facilities that just aren't designed to take this kind of strain. The river sections uh, make up, actually rivers and lakes make up about two thirds of the total mileage of the system. Uh, and they act more like rivers, act more like the situation that, the situations that John was describing. Um, the walls in river sections are even taller than they are in the, uh, in the land cut section simply because the water fluctuates so much more. So they're at least six feet from normal pool up to the, uh, to the lip, to the bull nose on the top of the wall. Um, they flood uh, and you get all of the kind of um, hazards and strain on equipment that you get in, in, in ever, every uh, river system. It's not like this every year. But it happens often enough that this is very, very hard on, uh, on uh, marine equipment, docks and otherwise. In the Mohawk Valley, in the eastern part of the system, there are eight movable dams. They look like this in the summertime uh, when during the navigation season. They're lowered into the riverbed and they raise a pool upstream of the dam um, that boats can navigate. And they're, they're next to each lock. In the wintertime, uh, or in late fall, they uh, hoist the, uh, the dam section up out of the river, up against the underside of the bridge, um, and allow the river to flow freely. Uh, that allows floodwaters and ice and floating debris and all the other stuff that comes down the river um, to pass uh, unobstructed. But it makes for designing for, for boater facilities kind of challenging because oftentimes they're left high and dry uh, during, uh, during the off season. We've got 57 locks. Uh, most people think of them as a delightful uh, way to uh, uh, tour the system. Um, but again, we're still dealing with vertical walls and uh, it's not always easy to get in and out of these places as, as much as they are, as, as nice as they are. And we've got competing uses. Uh, we've got both power boats and, uh, and uh, uh, paddlers. We've got fishermen, we've got rowing shells. Um, and uh, that can sometimes lead to some conflicts like happened on this sunny summer day uh, outside of Rome. So we are fortunate that um, accessible and, and um, uh, sporting activities, inclusive sports, um, 
there are a lot of people that are working on that. And, and we're fortunate that many of them are close to home and they're working on the canal system. So I'd like to introduce a couple of them. Uh, the guy on the right is Peter Abley. Peter uh, runs a business called Erie Canal Boat Company uh, in Fairport, which is just east of Rochester. Um, and he rents uh, uh, canoes, kayaks, cycles, uh, what have you. The woman with her back to the camera is Anita O'Brien, and she runs an organization called Rochester Accessible Adventures. And Rochester Accessible Adventures is all about inclusive sports, whether it's skiing or hockey or wheelchair uh, basketball or cycling or paddling, RAA is, is involved. And what Anita will tell you um, every time you meet her or, or soon after you meet her is that for everybody with a disability, they all have three, four, maybe more friends and family members who are looking for something that they can do together. And so it's not just addressing the needs of people with disabilities, it's addressing the larger community of people um, who, who want to be with those individuals. Uh, and as a consequence, about 10 years ago, Peter started buying and renting uh, adaptive kayaks and adaptive bicycles. And those now constitute about 15% of his business. Uh, and people will come from as far away as Binghamton to take advantage or, or to utilize that equipment. Now, the device that they're using in this photograph is called a Hoyer lift. Um, you might see these more or be more accustomed to seeing these in hospitals or nursing homes. They're typically used to get people from, say, a wheelchair into bed or a wheelchair into the shower. Um, in this instance, uh, Peter adapted one so it helps people get, lifts them out of their chair and lowers them into the seat of a kayak. Um, so it's not fully adaptive in the sense that someone can do it on their own, but it does allow people to get in and out of, of boats that, that might not be able to otherwise. Peter and Anita introduced us to the guy in the boat here. That's Ken Rhino. Um, Ken is an avid paddler who happens to be a wheelchair user. And if you spend time with Ken, he will tell you that he feels pretty confined sometimes in his chair, but uh, when he's in his boat, he's as free and as capable as anybody else on the water. Um, so Ken was really an inspiration and, and a huge source of information. He had insights and he had worked with other paddlers uh, on, on you know, what works and what doesn't work. What everyone we talked to said was, it's way more than just buying a piece of equipment. There are a number of vendors out there who are willing to say, hey, you know, I, I can sell you something. I can sell you an ADA compliant kayak launch. Just plop it in the water and you'll be fine. Well, it's a little more involved than that. And it really requires a fair amount of thought that goes, as, as John was saying, from the parking lot all the way to the water and back again. It's not just an individual piece of equipment, uh, a, a slide or, or, a, or a roller ramp. As I mentioned earlier, the, the ADA guidelines and, and, and standards tend to focus on people in wheelchairs, but disabilities and abilities come in many, many forms and flavors. And what may work well for somebody in a wheelchair may not work at all for somebody who's blind. Uh, or, or is hard of hearing or has other um, issues. So one of the things you, in an ideal world, we would design as many different opportunities uh, to get in and out of the water at a site as we can. Um, you know, this is an idealized drawing, but you've got a bank launch, you've got a, a floating dock with a slide, you've got a, a trailer launch, and there are probably other things that you could, you could add as well. Um, we don't always have the luxury of space, but it's something to think about that, that uh, what, what works for one user group may not work at all for another. The other thing that you need to bear in mind, uh, if you're a river manager buying equipment or if somebody's trying to sell you something, is seek multiple proposals. Now, in this instance, the initial proposal that came in, let's see if my pointer works, this is the original gangway that went down to the, and landed about here on the dock. Way, way, way too steep. Um, uh, certainly not ADA compliant, uh, although it's, well, anyway, I won't go. <laughs> but 
And, and the first proposal was, well, we're going to use that existing ramp and we're going to put in a little floating roller slide right here in this slip between these two finger piers. And you look at that and go, well, A, the ramp's too sleep, steep, and B, how am I going to swing a boat if I'm coming down, whether I'm carrying it on my shoulder or dragging it behind a wheelchair, how am I going to negotiate the turn between the rail and the wall? Um, it just... It doesn't work. And this again is, you know, this may be unique to the canal, but we got a lot of vertical walls and we got a lot of swinging and clearance issues. So we encourage the, the, the village to seek other bids and to seek them as proposals, not as bids, not as here's a set of drawings, what do you bid to build it? More go to other vendors and say, here's our situation, what would you do to, um, to make it better? And in this instance, uh, the, the winning bidder, our winning proposal, first of all, use the existing ramp, but put it on a landing, which uh, made the pitch less, and then a short ramp, which is a lot cheaper than buying an 80-footer. Um, and then they put the uh, launch at the end of the pier, which means it's a straight shot. You, you come down, you go the length of the main floating dock and, and uh, drop in at, at the end. Um, and, and it just, you know, it, it worked better. And I think it wouldn't have, you know, villages or municipalities are often under pressure to, you know, get a set of drawings and then go to the lowest bid. And, and in this case, we said, do it as an RFP process. How would you solve our proposal? And it ended up, this actually ended up being cheaper than the original proposal. <laughs> um, here's a, a, a fairly interesting solution to a, to a boat ramp situation. We, we find a lot of these and it's good until you look at some of the details. Um, this floating dock system is kind of all of these ones that are just uh, molded plastic, they're kind of squishy. And a wheelchair has a, uh, a pretty concentrated uh, point loading. Uh, an athletic chair has very narrow tires, often narrower than a road bike. Um, a power chair can be weigh 300 pounds uh, plus the weight of the rider. So it's pretty unsteady to come out onto this, this squishy surface in a chair. The other problem with this particular one is there's no edge protection. If the chair starts to go off to the side, there's nothing to present you, prevent you from falling into the canal, um, which would be pretty unpleasant for all involved. Here's a, a preferred solution. It's got a solid deck and, and uh, edge protection, a bull rail all the way around. Uh, the bull rail not only keeps chairs from going off the edge, it also provides a handhold. It allows some paddlers who may not prefer to use the slide to uh, launch off the edge. Uh, you, can, you can tie up to it. It's got a lot of advantages to it. This uh, launch also has a, a transfer bench, uh, which allows someone to go from a wheelchair onto uh, the first step, which is the same height as a typical wheelchair seat, and then gradually work their way down uh, until they're uh, in, the, in their boat. Um, a lot of these uh, transfer benches, the previous one didn't, but this one uh, has a pullout slide that further allows some, someone to get over the, uh, the top of their boat um, and, and handrails. Um, this installation also has these webbing loops. Uh, a lot of the, you know, look at the woman's position of her arms. Once the slide goes back, she drops into the uh, seat. When she comes back at the end of the paddle, that bar is too high to reach. So the, uh, the webbing loops are a very cheap um, uh, retrofit to anything that's got an overhead bar um, that, that'll help people get out of their boats as, as well as getting into them. Now, I've got mixed, personally, I've got mixed feelings about uh, the slides because they can, uh, they can gum up and jam and kind of become a maintenance headache, but they, they help. I'd like you to take a look at this photo for a sec and see if you notice anything odd. This is Ken Rhino again. If you notice, he's not using the transfer table, uh, the transfer bench, nor is he using the overhead bar. And the reason is that those fixtures are above a set of rollers. And as Ken will tell you, he's got brakes on his chair. He can lock his chair into place. But then moving from the chair over the transfer table, 
up onto a boat that's mounted on rollers that might scoot out from underneath you at any minute, that's pretty anxiety producing. And so we see this time and again, we see these rollers and it's like, yeah, but how are you going to keep the boat in position? Uh, rollers are all, also can become a maintenance headache. Uh, this is a dock uh, on the ribbon cutting day in 2011. And this is what it looked like six years later in 2017. Uh, the rollers are gone. Uh, the handrails are bent. The transfer slide is jammed uh, and, and at this point is unmovable. Um, so, you know, you need to think about both safety of the paddler and maintainability for the organization that's responsible for, uh, for the equipment in, in the long term. This may be a preferable setup. Um, the, uh, the slide material, the angled slide, is covered with the same kind of material that you see in dairy stalls. It's uh, a plastic, it's a molded nylon. It's a little slippery, but not so slippery that the boat's gonna scoot out, scoot out from underneath you. Once you're in the boat, you can slide, uh, slide down the way. Another alternative is, uh, is uh, uh, synthetic lumber uh, tracks or something like it that gives a, a semi-slippery uh, base enough that you can transfer to the boat uh, feeling fairly comfortable without um, without having it roll away on you. Uh, maintenance is always an issue. Uh, any of these things are, can become a debris trap. It works a whole lot better if they're facing downstream. Um, I've seen way too many instances where they're either, the worst case, of course, is if they're facing upstream, but even slightly angled to, uh, to the river, uh, they're going to catch uh, weeds and branches and, and floating debris. And interestingly, this one has a, a, a perforated deck that would be self-flushing if it were facing downstream. In the interest of, of durability and, and, and long-term uh, stuff, you're, you're actually much better off if you do it as site work on shore than if you do it with, uh, with equipment. So in this instance, uh, you've got a fairly steep riverbank on the Hudson, part of water, a body of water that rises up and down a lot, um, even, even during the canal navigation season. So, you know, the upper level is where that fence is, and you can see there's a nice overlook. What they did was build a concrete ramp that absorbed most of the grade between the parking area and uh, and the riverbank. There's a level spot, level landing at the base of that, and then the uh, uh, the gangway proceeds from there at a, at a gentler slope. All Everything you see that's aluminum gets pulled out uh, in the wintertime uh, or, or it would be wrecked. Now some wheelchair users will tell us enough, don't give us a slide, don't give us a roller dock, don't give us any of that, just give us a firm beach um, I'll figure out how to transfer from my chair into the boat. And a number of the examples that John showed were, were you know, of that sort. Um, so that kind of got us thinking about, well, if it's not, again, since it's not ADA regulated and it's not ADA required, what would we do to make that kind of boarding easier uh, at, at, a, at a firm slope. You still need a firm surface. And what do you do in deep water? Well, here's an example that's not on the canal. It's in Boston Harbor, um, but it's a floating dock with a ramp on it. Then the ramp essentially is an artificial beach uh, that uh, goes into deep water. The floating dock rises and falls with the tide. This photo happened to be taken at extremely low tide, um, but um, you know you get the idea. There are also some simple fixes. Again, the vendors will be happy to sell you all sorts of plastic gee gaws that, uh, that may or may not make it easier to get in and out of your, your kayak. But this was dealt with uh, by, a, by the Department of Public Works, the village DPW. Paddler said, gee, your docks are awful high for us to get in and out. The DPW welded up some angle iron brackets and bolted them to a couple of planks and attached those to either side of one of the finger piers. Really cheap, really simple makes it way more paddler friendly than, than it would be. And most floating docks in sort of conventional floats and, and, and framing are usually 14 to 18 inches above the water, the deck, sometimes more. So um, it's, it's a handy thing. You can do the same thing with a fixed dock um, if, if you've got fairly consistent water levels. And this one, um, 
all they did, and again, it's not on the canal. In fact, it's in North Carolina. Um, they simply put an upright post uh, firmly attached to the edge of the dock. You know, and think about that for folks who, you know, may not be wheelchair users, but may, like me, may, you know, on the far side of 65, are having some difficulty getting in and out of our boat on a daily basis. Um, simply having something you can grab a hold of uh, makes life a whole lot easier. So here are some, some links, and, and these will be in the chat as well. Um, Access Board, National Network is really set up. They've got chapters throughout the country to help people out. Team River Runner um, is someone who work, is an organization that works with uh, Ken Rhino a lot. Uh, Team River Runner is uh, focused on, on uh, injured veterans. Um, they have chapters throughout the country. Unfortunately, they do not have chapters in New England or New York, so I don't have personal experience working with them. Um, but they've done a lot for, for promoting river access. And then Anita's organization, Rochester Accessible Adventures, is, uh, is there at the bottom of the page. And of course, our hand launch facility guidelines are available online. Uh, there's a link for that uh, in, in the document. Um, and I guess that's it. Oh, Canal Way Challenge. This is something that was started a few years ago to get people out on the water. And uh, you can you can accrue. It's sort of self-paced. And in a given season, you can do 15 or uh, 90 or 150 or all 350 miles. Um, but perhaps the most gratifying is it was instituted a few years ago, and that was the first mile challenge for people who have disabilities of any sort just to get out and do a mile, and in many cases, it is their first mile. Um, and so far, the past two years, COVID and all, uh, they had 175, 174 people that signed up for the first mile challenge. So that's it. That's me. There's a link there to the uh, design guideline. As I say, Mo Mona's there. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Risa. I'm going to stop sharing and hand it back to you guys. Thanks so much, Duncan. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Are there questions? I, let's check the chat. Sort of a lot of information that John and Duncan have shared. We will, if we don't put them in the chat, we'll send all the links that Duncan has offered as well as others to a whole variety of, of really good resources from the ADA itself to Team River Runner and the, and the um, folks in New York. Any other questions? We do have, um, while, while we're waiting, we do have a survey we'd love for you to take and then just a little bit about some of the programs that are coming up. So if a question occurs to you in the next couple of minutes, don't hesitate. Angie, I think the next slide has that survey in it. Oh, there we go. There we go. Here's the survey link. Thanks. Yeah, so I did put the survey link in the chat there. would love to hear your feedback on this session. And also, while you might be thinking of any last minute questions, just want to remind everyone that we are recording this session. We'll email out a link to the recording and we also post it on our river training channel where you can watch this as well as almost all of our previous round tables um, we also i recommend checking out the river training center I apologize, I have a poor connection. So I'm going to turn off my camera. Um, and then I just wanted to share, um, thank you. Here are Duncan and John's emails. And I might have missed a page. I did see. Um, You're going to have to. Uh, that, a question that one, in the I chat. Think, 
Um, you're going to have to edit, edit my email. I'll, um, I'll, I'll talk with you offline on that. Oh, right. Sorry, John. We'll send, make sure we send that out with the, with the others. You know, since, since we've got a couple of minutes, um, I actually have a video of one of these successful launches in use. And, uh, yeah, go for it. Okay. I don't know. Whoops. Hang on. Um, let me see if I can make it work uh, with my shared screen. So this is, uh, this is Ken Rhino. Um, I'm going to end the recording for this presentation because folks will have this link, but go ahead.